Right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another session. This time, welcome to Leonard Tregebro from Red Hat, talking to you about your keyboard. Hello. Uh, thank you again for uh, organizing this conference. It's as always very good and uh, very nice to be here. Um, and I realized last year here at Python Peel that a lot of people don't actually choose their keyboards. They just use whatever happens to come with a thesis or a diorama. Uh, but the keyboard is the analog digital interface that you're using. You know, that's what makes your physical movements into code. You think code here, you want code there, it has to travel through your fingers and your keyboard. So it's very important. It needs to be adapted to you. Whoops. Uh, and it needs adaptation so you can type quickly and accurately, but also so you can continue to use it all day long without getting pain in your fingers. <clears throat> because most people never get any problems, so you don't really have to worry, but it's good to take care of yourself anyway and think about these things and having a good posture. The most common problem uh, is in the carpal tunnel, or, uh, when it comes to serious problems anyway. Something called the carpal tunnel syndrome. The carpal tunnel is that you have a muscle here and you have another muscle and there's a ligament in between and under that ligament the sinews for your fingers goes and some nerves and blood vessels and stuff goes down here. And if that gets irritated and inflamed or infected you'll get pain when you move your fingers and you have a problem typing on the keyboard. So the first thing we're going to do is some exercise. So I'm going to put down the microphone and screen. Um, so I'm going to move my hands around like this, that's not actually part of the exercise, it's just so you can see what you do. So you just hold your hands whatever, in whatever position that's comfortable, and you stretch your fingers up, and then you bend them down, like this, and then you stretch your fingers up, and you make a fist, and you stretch your fingers up, and you make a table, stretch your fingers up, and you do thumbs up, and here you can also stretch this muscle here, a little bit, stretch, stretch, and up again, and then you can stretch the whole hand. Thank you. And it's a good warm up before starting to code, you go, ah, look very professional. <laughs> um, and then we're going to talk about the history of the keyboard, uh, because it's interesting to know why the keyboard looks like it looks. And it was created for mechanical typewriters. This is actually the Hansen Skrikule, the Hansen typing board. It's the world's first typewriter, uh, or commercially available typewriter. It's the world's first. It looks very steampunk. If you want one, there's around 40 in existence. They go uh, in sale, uh, depending on uh, the, uh, how, how well it's maintained, between 50 and 150,000 dollars. So yeah, you, you're not going to use one of these. <laughs> As you can see, the designer is mostly worried about uh, how to get letters onto paper. So you have this uh, round thingy, it's not actually a uh, circular, it's a bent board which you put the paper on. And then the keys quite simply uh, have a little hammer at the end of them, you just push the key down and it will whack. Uh, the key onto the paper, and then there's a mechanism to move it forward. So it's quite, it's not that complicated, really. But it didn't really take off. He sold maybe a little bit over a hundred, and then he died, and then the whole thing stopped. And, but at the same time, there were some Americans that were also working on keyboards. And they started from the keyboard, because they're going, we need to some way to press something to get key, to get letters on the paper. What do we have that you can press? Well, pianos. They have keyboards, so we'll use them. This is the bottom of the first prototype. They quickly went away from piano keys that looked like piano keys, but there's still basically piano key movement in here. And then you see that there's a wire that goes up to this mechanism above. There are these levers with hammers on at the end, and you just push them and uh, it whacks the hammer against this wooden roller, 
and the wooden program has a paper, of course, and between the hammer and the paper, there's a piece of cloth with ink on it. That's how a typewriter works. Because these hammers are arranged in a circle, if you press two keys at the same time, they can become entangled, they get stuck in each other. So, to make that happen less often, keys that are used often together in the English language were placed opposite each other in the ring of hammers, or at least not too close to each other. And you get this layout, can you see? Yeah, you can see. It's QWE-TY. Um, this typewriter is usually called the Schultz and Glidden typewriter because those are the main developers. Lots of people were involved, but Schultz and Glidden are the main guys. They showed this prototype to the um, uh, Remington factory that made sewing machines, and they licensed it and started manufacturing it, and it looks like this. Remington apparently realized that having a dash in the middle of the letters was kind of weird, so we got the QWERTY layout. It looks pretty much like it does today. There's no one and there's no zero. You use I and O for that instead. There's no uh, lowercase letter, it's all capital. And M is in the wrong position, so to speak, as what we are used to today. But basically, this is the quirky layout. Other people started manufacturing typewriters at the same time, but the layout was patented, so they used other layouts. But the Remington was so popular that it became standard. So once the patent was out of, uh, had run out, uh, everybody started using this layout. You can also see that they have invented the space bar here. That's the wooden thing at the bottom. They soon invented shift keys, which means you can get lower keys. And in uh, 1893, so that's almost 20 years later, somebody invented front striking, which means that you can actually see what you type. So it doesn't hit the bottom of this roller anymore, it hits the front. This uh, typewriter is from 1896. It's the Underwood number one, and it's the first one that basically combines everything. It has front striking, it has a shift key, it has a QWERTY keyboard, and it also has a little bell that goes ding when you come close to the end of the paper, so that you know that it's time to start a new row. And up to 1961, this is basically how typewriters look. They might have different uh, designs, they might be more compact, but the basic mechanism is the same as this Underwood. No big improvements was made until 1961, when well, this came wrong. This is the IBM Selectric. They replaced this basket of hammers, as it's actually called, with a ball that would have letters on it and would whack the paper. This means that no longer did hammers get stuck into each other. The QWERTY keyboard was now outdated, but of course that's what everybody uses anyway. You could also replace the ball and have different fonts. So typically you bought one of these and you would get both a uh, uh, Helvetica font and you would get a Courier font and you, can get, uh, you could get script fonts and everything to look like handwriting, which nobody believed in. <coughs> But of course, in 1961, there was another business machine that was up and coming, and that was the computers. They needed terminals, so this is from 1965, an IBM 2741. And if you think it looks like a selective typewriter, you're right. It's essentially a selective typewriter. But screens come along quickly. This is from 1972, the first of the IBM 3270 series of terminals. Type the, the keyboard basically looks like a selector key, and you see what long, how long the space bar is. That looks so strange today. The space bar is almost the size of the keyboard. Uh, and to the right are function keys. It's not a numerical keyboard, they're function keys. And how many are there? There are 12. How many are there on your keyboard today? 12. This is the reason. Later, during the 70s, people started using uh, computer terminals for data entry. There's a lot of, you have databases and you have a lot of numbers that needed to be typed in, so therefore you get a numerical keyboard. The previous terminal were basically used by the administrators of the software of the machine. But this keyboard, this terminal is made for uh, office workers. So it has a numerical keyboard. 
And if you wonder why this history contains only IBM keyboards, that's because uh, all the computers we use today are descendants of the IBM PC and its keyboard. This is the 1984 Model M keyboard. It's the quiz quintessential uh, PC keyboard. The only change to the design since this is that Microsoft added a command key because they were jealous that Apple had one. Um, and most of its features, or some of its features, come from IBM's desire to unify its systems and be able to use uh, the, the different parts over all the systems. So although the terminal keyboards look slightly different and have different layouts from this PC keyboard you see here, they use the same mechanics and they use the same keys and they use very much similar layouts. And this, this uh, and also you wanted to do, do terminal emulations on your PC, so you didn't have to have a separate terminal and a separate PC. And this is why the IBM PC keyboard has things like scroll, lock, sys request and break that is never ever used in any PC software. I actually saw one around 90 that used scroll lock. Uh, but I've never seen anybody use sys request or break. So, and so the scroll lock was actually, when you press the scroll lock, the arrow keys would no longer move the cursor, it would move the whole screen instead. You can, you can uh, in all games, you can also use break for sounds. Ah, oh, see, I didn't know that. Uh, you, can use, you can use scroll lock in the USSR, lame uh, terminal program. Ah, okay. Can you repeat? Uh, I, I didn't really hear the last one, you said. That you, it was in what you did use to scroll up? Yeah? Uh, on, in Linux, in the next console, it will actually pause scrolling. Aha! Okay, I didn't even know that. You can pause the scrolling by pressing scroll lock in, in the most terminals in, uh, in Linux today. See? So uh, it's for, that's actually useful. That's again, terminal emulation, that's what it's there for actually. Um, so, this is of course a Latin keyboard for the Latin alphabet. If you use something else, if you use something that has alphabets, your typewriter is going to look very different. This doesn't even have keys, it actually has a set of loose types, so this is a Chinese typewriter. So you can actually move which words, change which words you want by actually taking out the types with a little tweezer, as you see. And then you just move the whole mechanism and the paper and everything to the type, to the word you want, and you press it down and it will pick up the type and whack it on paper. So there's no key at all, and there's no keyboard. And the keyboard for this would of course be massive and not very practical to use. So therefore, uh, Chinese and Japanese use the same standard keyboards, but they have complicated input mechanisms that I don't really know very much about, because I don't speak any of those languages. So the rest of this talk is going to be about keyboards for alphabets, uh, like Latin alphabets. That's the end of the um, history lesson, and this is why the keyboard looks like it does. And it has straight rows of keys with a slight offset, which is important, because if you look at your keyboard, the keys aren't straight like this, but they're not straight like this, because each key needed to have a little own metal pin to this basket of uh, uh, hammers. So that's why they're offset. It has a QWERTY layout, has a numerical keyboard, unless it's a laptop, uh, and a bunch of function keys, unless it's a laptop, where you have to press ALT for it to be function keys, because you use it for other things instead. And that's because the function keys are kind of outdated, we don't use function keys very much. Windows 3 and Windows 95 had a lot of features for the function keys. You could do a lot of stuff with the function keys, but nobody bothered learning that. So it kind of fell out of use. Um, so the first of the outdated things is that you have keys in a row. And uh, this is outdated because there's basically two modes of typing, and the first first school of typing, I should say, two schools. The first school is called home row touch typing, and the second school is no school, because there's only one school. 
And overall touch typing is, of course, that you put your fingers on the whole row, as it's called the middle row, and these eight keys, and then you just move your fingers. You don't move your hands, you just move your fingers. That makes for accurate and fast typing if you train your hands to do this. But, of course, this picture is very uh, unrealistic. Whoever has drawn this apparently thinks arms are come out from the stomach. But this is how we actually use home row touch typing with a normal keyboard. And you see that there are angles in the wrists. And this is not good for the wrist, this is uncomfortable. So if you are a touch typist, how many are touch typists? That's a good question. One, two, three, four, five, six, oh, so 10, 20 people are touch typists. If you do that, you probably want an ergonomic keyboard, a keyboard that doesn't have keys in a row. Well, actually, this keyboard has keys in a row, but you see it's up and down instead. So this is better for your hands, right? But doing this on a mechanical typewriter would be very complicated, so nobody did it. But now, when we have uh, electronic just keys, it's much easier to do. So this you can find quite cheaply. Uh, so, if you're doing touch typing, that's probably what you should use. You might even think of something like this. This is, and I, sorry if I uh, mispronounced this, I think it's a kinesis. That's what they're called, kinesis advantage. And this is, of course, for touch typists, but this is very popular, uh, relatively speaking, amongst programmers. If you go to PyCon US, you, uh, during the space this year, I saw three people, I think, that had these keyboards. They tend to be quite fanatical about them and, of course, drag them around the world. So here you see that not only are the keys you know, in a nice angle and are ergonomic, they've actually bothered putting them so they're the same distance from your fingers, no matter what position you are. Uh, I'm sure they're really good, but if you want to use these, you really have to be a touch typist, so you don't have to learn touch typing. So they're very slow in the beginning if you uh, when you adapt to them, and they're probably also they're also expensive. For the rest of us, we are not touch typists and use no school typing. We don't have this problem because we don't put our hands in an angle. We just hover the hands over the keyboard and move. The hands around. This is slower, not as accurate, but it's easier to learn. And if you do that, then generally having some sort of ergonomic or split keyboard is actually quite annoying. The second thing that's outdated is the QWERTY layout. Uh, it is done to speed up typing, but it's done to speed up typing on typewriters. Now there are several different layouts that are done to speed up typing on computers instead. The most famous of these are uh, Tvorek. Um, but uh, yeah, right, I should say that every country has their own QWERTY layout, because it's not the same. Some even move around the A to Z letters, that's what I want to say. Some countries have many official languages and many different keyboards, and even though many countries share the same language, they tend to have their own keyboard. Uh, Spanish Latin America is an exception, they have the same keyboard, but it's different from the keyboard in Spain, and so on. Um, some countries, of course, have different keyboard layouts for the same language, like Poland, most notably, which has two layouts, one is called programmer's layout and the other is called that stupid layout nobody uses but it's Windows switches to randomly. <laughs> and some move around the Latin letters too, this is French layout called EZT. Um, it not only moves A, Q, Z and W, and has, it has M in the old position, as you can see. You have to press Shift to get numbers. This is it's a very, very annoying layout, uh, which I then, of course, had to use for several years. Um, and the origins of this are completely lost in history. Personally, I think it's because some French keyboard manufacturer or typewriter manufacturer wanted to avoid the QWERTY patent. That's probably the main reason. Germany has a 
transverse layout that puts T and Z beside each other, even though this is a common combination in the German language. At least in theory, this should mean that the German typewriters jammed quite a lot. Uh -huh. But now the keyboards are electronic, and they only jam if you spill Coca-Cola or coffee even. So the quality layout is outdated. Now we come to the Dvorak layout. Uh, the Dvorak layout, the English-American Dvorak layout, has the vowels on the left hand and the most common consonants on the right hand home row, which means that you quite often can type a lot of uh, words, not only without moving your fingers at all, but also you use um, each hand alternately, which means that you can type quite fast, at least in theory. It also avoids moving your uh, hands up and down a lot, or your fingers up and down. If you, for example, try to type minimum on a QWERTY keyboard, you use only the right hand and you don't use the middle row at all, and only two fingers for touch typing. So it's a lot of jumping up and down, that's not very fast. So Dvorak tries to fix that. It might not be perfect, because it actually American English uses Z quite a lot when you say eyes all the time. Um, so minimize, and it's used down on the left, the right hand little finger. But for British English, it's probably a little bit better. Which is strange because I think Tor was American. But they know. Um, another, uh, and every country needs its own local variation of Tor, just as it is with uh, QWERTY, and. Uh, of course, here again, they should actually do statistical analysis on your language and move the keys around after that, according to the same principle. But for some reason, nobody does that. Localized forks all keep the American layout and then just move around punctuation to squeeze in local characters. Uh, worse than that, there's generally no agreement among Dvorak people on what layout to use for a certain language in a certain country. Uh, Swedish has two layouts. One uses the American punctuation layout, uh, but squeezes in the Swedish letters. Um, that makes it pretty good for programming because brackets are easily acceptable, accessible. The other uses a Swedish layout that moves keys around, which means you can easily make your own Dvorak keyboard and very cheaply by just moving the keycaps around. So that's also a benefit, but that means it's not so good for programming and it tends to be programmers that use Dvorak. So there's a bit of a fight in Sweden about that. I don't know why, but Poland seems to have three different Dvorak layouts. But then you get a lot to choose from at least, so that's good. Uh, another layout is called the Colmac, done by a guy called Colmac, but the layout called Colmac to sound like Dvorak. It keeps punctuation in the same place as QWERTY and it moves around letters to speed things up, but only if necessary, and that means it's quite similar to QWERTY. Um, so it's easier to learn. It also claims to be better, partly because it doesn't have Z on the right hand little finger, but instead has it on the left hand little finger, so I'm not entirely clear on why that would be better. It makes caps lock into a second backspace, because who uses cap lock, so that's good. The last one I'm going to mention is the workman layout. It realizes something that, funnily enough, neither Dvorak nor Coleman realized, and that is that if you use home row touch typing on a normal keyboard, um, your index finger actually doesn't, it's a little bit of a stretch to move it up, but moving it down is easy. The other fingers, up is easy, and down is a little bit uncomfortable, but the index finger would rather move down, so therefore the common um, keys are in this layout, on the workman layout. And all these claim to be more accurate and faster than QWERTY, and all these kind of claim to be more accurate and faster than each other, and it turned out to be kind of difficult to prove this. And that's because to be accurate and fast, you have to practice a lot. So if you actually want to know which one of these are fastest, 
you have to like spend two years with each layout and then measure your speed. Uh, and that of course is quite impractical. What you can do is that you can check how much feet your fingers move. And the order that I've shown you here, Ferti, Dvorak, Komak and Workman, is actually less movement of fingers in English uh, per layout. So the Coleman can at least claim that you move your fingers at least. Um, if this actually means that you're faster and more accurate, it's, it turns out to be hard to prove. And that's of course why QWERTY is still around. Because it's good enough, it is not a huge difference when you switch for most people, and it takes a lot of work to switch. Also, Dvorak moves where X, C and V are, which means copy and copy and pasting gets annoying. Uh, and Dvorak has S over on the right hand, so saving is now a two-hand move. So, uh, might not be worth it. The last, and the third, and last outdated thing I'm going to mention is the numerical keypad. It's used for data entry, it's good if you're working for a bank. Right? But if you're not working for a bank or an economist or anything, you don't actually use the numerical keyboard very much. And it's in the way, because it forces you to hold your arm too far to the right, and then you need to lift your arm a little bit, unless you have very wide shoulders. So for women or people like me who have narrow shoulders, this actually can be uncomfortable. I want the mouse down here. And that's where the numerical keypad is. Uh, so, therefore, you often want a keyboard that doesn't have a numerical keypad. You want the mouse there instead, unless you're actually using the numerical keypad a lot, but you don't. But if you go to some store that sells computer parts and you look for a keyboard that doesn't have a numerical keypad, it tends to be a miniature keyboard with small keys, unless you're buying it from Apple. Um, and you don't want small keys, definitely not. That's horrible to use for practice. So then you have to usually buy these things online, and then it's hard to find. It took me quite a long time to figure out that it's called 10 keyless. That's what you're Googling for. 10 keyless keyboards. That's not obvious, because nobody calls the numerical keypad the 10 keys. But 10 keyless layouts like this. This is how my keyboard looks, the one that I have. It's not a picture of my keyboard, and you can see that because it doesn't have Swedish layout, which I use. But this is the brand that, that I end up buying. So I've got a tankiness keyboard. But there's a bit of buyer's beware when you buy things online. There's two physical layouts used for PC. ISO and ANSI, the international standard and the American standard, because of course Americans refuse to use the international standard. Uh, they got to have their own. And the ANSI layout, it has one key too little. You can see there uh, that the left shift is very big and uh, it has uh, one key less than the ISO layout. Also, the entry key looks different. In Poland, for Polish layout, you can use whatever of this, because this extra key that uh, ISO has is just duplicating another key in the Polish layout. So you don't actually lose a key when you use ANSI, and ANSI is also the most popular one in Poland. So you can buy an ISO keyboard if you want to, but be prepared to miss the enter key a lot. And press the wrong key. So therefore it's important to buy the one that you're used to. Of course, I'm Swedish, I need ISO layout, especially if I type HTML, because otherwise I don't have brackets. And now we come to the really fun bit. After talking about why the keyboard is outdated, we can get to talk about actual key switch mechanics. But before we talk about the key switch mechanics, we're going to talk about why that matters. And this graph will explain to you why. This is a force pressure graph, so the uh, y-axis here upwards is more force. It's how much force you have to use to um, 
to pull the key down, to push the key button down. I mean. And uh, this, the x-axis axis is how far the key has moved. And you can see that the, this key can move four millimeters, and that uh, number is called the travel. It has a four millimeter deep travel, and it has in the forest graph a bump. And this bump means that you press down the key, and it doesn't mean that the force that you're pressing the key with lowers. Of course, that would be impossible. You are pressing the key with the force that you are. What happens is that the key will quickly move from this bump over to where the force is equal again. And you see that during this distance, this movement of a slightly over one millimeter that you get, there's a black dot. And that's the point where the key actually is pressed, where it's actuated and a character shows up on your screen. This means that you can feel in your fingers when you press the key, because suddenly the finger moves a millimeter very quickly. So you feel in your fingers, and feeling in probably in Latin, Latin is called something that starts with tact, and therefore it's called tactile. So these keys are called tactile, you can feel when you've pressed them in your fingers. Most people like that, not everybody do, but most people do. Here is the quiz quint essential again, tactile key. The most famous one is called uh, a catastrophically collapsing spring key. And this is because this spring is pressed down, but it's not stabilized. So, as you know, if you press down on a long string, it will bend and it will fly away. Now, it can't fly away in this case, but it will bend. And that means you press, and you have to press more and more because it's a spring, and then suddenly it bends, and the key will move uh, a lot very quickly. So you get a tactile feedback. You will also get not just the tactile feedback, because when the spring hits the sidewall, it will make a pretty loud click. So you get audible click feedback. So these type of tactile uh, keys are called the click key. And here you see the force graph for this IBM buckling spring. So this is what's used in this uh, IBM Model M. And you can see the force graph here is that it falls very straight down at the point where you actually press the key. And since it has such a sharp downward movement, there are some people who refuse to use anything else. They really like these IBM buckling spring keyboards and they're actually still manufactured not by IBM anymore, but under license. Uh, but they're pretty loud. Uh, they were designed for office environments that actually still used typewriters. So from that point of view, they're kind of silent. But today, office environments are very quiet, and people are going to get really pissed off at you if you start using this. But if you, you know, if you have your own office or something, then it's fine. But you have to press quite hard, they, you, they need a lot of force to pull down, and they have a lot of travel, so uh, it's quite few people who, who like them, but those who like them are again quite fanatical about them. The third type is called linear, and they don't have any feedback at all. There's no tactile feedback, there's no audible feedback. And some people like this. This is especially uh, not the problem. If your travel is very short. If you have a long travel, then it's hard to know when the key is actually pressed. If it's short travel, it doesn't matter because you will always bottom out the key anytime, right? And now we then come to switch, switch mechanics. And there are three different types of mechanics that are in use today that are popular. Uh, the first one is called rubber dome. And you can hear that it's the worst one because it is not even a thunder dome, it's a rubber dome. And uh, yeah, there's a piece of rubber, and you press down on it. They're usually today connected to these uh, transparent plastic membranes with circuitry in them, which uh, feels the capacitance, I think. So they actually, they, they feel that there's a change going on when you bend this plastic, basically. Rubber domes are cheap, but they tend to be a little bit spongy and wobbly and unstable. To improve that, the scissor switch was in, in, uh, uh, invented. So the scissor switch uses 
uh, scissors on each side of the uh, of the uh, uh, key to keep it stable and not to make it feel so wobbly. Uh, that's a patent, of course, so other manufacturers have other variations of this, but that give the same result. And they're generally all called scissor switches, even if they don't use scissors. One benefit of scissor switches is that you can make them with very low travel, something like two millimeters or even lower. And that means that they're not very deep, and that means they get stuck into laptops. So laptops, you generally use scissor switches or some other mechanic that is not actually scissor switch mechanics but give the same effect. Uh, so they're called scissor switches still. Uh, and they're, they're not bad, they're good, they have very short travel and that is good. I mean, remember the long travel that we have uh, are there because you actually physically have to move this little hammer and bang it on the, on the paper. We don't need that anymore, we don't need to have high force, we don't need to have long travel. Uh, so therefore, these are getting more and more popular and a lot of the keyboards that you will find out in, in stores if you want to find something and a lot of the ergonomic keyboard you will find today, uh, use scissor switches. And there's nothing wrong with them. They usually have a bit of tactile feel because you press on the rubber and then the rubber collapses. So they usually have tactile feedback and they're usually very silent because it's all rubber that takes the force. And the third type is called gold cross point switch. And they look like this and I don't know if you can see that really. But in there amongst this gold plated metal are two uh, metal tubes. One goes straight up and one goes on the other way so they cross each other like this. And at the point where they cross they are actually indented in some different kind of ways with some sort of pattern, uh, usually called a diamond pattern, which ensures the good contact. So because they're mechanical, they can take quite a lot of uh, different, uh, well, shit, basically, that you can throw at them. So dirt and dust is not usually a huge problem. These membranes, if you get a liquid inside the membranes, they're dead. You can never do anything, it's just you can just throw it away. Uh, that doesn't necessarily happen when you pour Coca-Cola in it because the membranes are full, they have to actually get Coca-Cola or coffee or tea or whatever on the edge. And then capillary action will suck in the liquid between the membranes and you can't use that keyboard anymore. Um, these kind of contacts, if you get uh, Coca-Cola or coffee or tea or some sugar liquid on them, they usually continue to work, but the keys get stuck because of the sugar when they dry out. So you press down a key and it doesn't pop up again. Um, so as an act of sort, I don't recommend this for a keyboard that is still usable, but if your keyboard is no longer usable and it has these kind of switches, try rinsing it in lukewarm water and then letting it dry for a couple of days. Surprisingly often that works. The most popular of these are called the Cherry MX switches. They are popular because they're, you know, good quality and they come in various versions. This, as you see, is brown. So this little plastic bit is what changes between different versions of these Cherry MX uh, keyboards. And you can see here in this animation how they get the tactile feedback. Right, you have a little, little, the little thing there that actually breaks the circuitry is shaped, so you will, it will change the force with how much the key, how the key travels. So there's lots of different colors. There's blue, there's red, there's white, there's uh, another kind of white. The, there's lots of different colors that have different characteristics, and that means you can find the one you actually want. The Cherry MX Brown is probably the most popular one. It has tactile feedback, but not a lot of tactile feedback, just a little bit. So that's pretty popular. However, even though it's not a clicky key, it's a tactile feed, it still will click. And that because at, when you hit the bottom, you'll get the plastic keycap hitting the key uh, mechanism itself, and that makes noise. So they're still pretty loud. 
They also have a normal travel, and a normal travel is not necessary. You might want to have a normal travel, it's all subjective, that is maybe what you want. Most people don't want the keys to travel as much as they do, but that is both fixable and it's easily fixable. Fixing the noise is called damping, you can do that in different ways. The top ones here are something that has to be built into the keyboard, so I haven't bothered about that really. The square ones are called landing pads, they're used for uh, uh, pretty much any kind of keyboard, you can just put these landing pads on. The rings are called O-rings, and they are used for Cherry MX keyboards. So uh, you simply just put the, take the keycap off, turn it upside down, stick this little rubber ring on, and uh, put it back. And now you have shorter travel, and the keyboard is silent. It's fit if you do it yourself. Some people that sell keyboards will actually do this for you. That's almost, but not quite, the end. I thought I would quickly mention some other wacky keyboards. This, for example, is a quarter keyboard. You don't actually press a key and get a character, you press combinations of keys. You have to press several keys for something to happen. But then you have so many combinations that you actually usually don't get characters out, you get syllables. This means you can type really stupidly fast. And these are what they use for subtitling uh, TV programs in real time. They use it in courtrooms and stuff like that to, to record things. So quarter keyboards. They're probably really crappy for programming. But it's still interesting, so I mentioned it. It's also worth mentioning that there are such things as touchless keyboards. You just you generally, you still touch them, but the point is that you don't have to apply any force. So this is good if you actually have pain in your fingers. This one gives you some sort of LEDs or light, so you break actually a light path when you put it around your fingers. Um, I used to have, I have one of these, but it's broken, unfortunately. This is actually two multi-touch pads. One for each hand, uh, and they use that multi-touch pad too. The right hand uh, moves the cursor, not the, the, uh, the mouse cursor, and the left hand moves the text cursor. So you can do shift and select very, very quickly, stuff like that. As touch points, they were awesome, but all touchless keyboards have one problem. There's no tactile feedback. You don't know if you've pressed the key or not. That makes them very slow, so that man is the reason I ended up not using this one. It's too bad. I had some ideas on how to fix that, how to get some type, you know, tactile feedback. And I, when I got those ideas, I'm going, I should contact this company, maybe they can actually start making these and have them so they work better. And the company was gone. It had been bought up by Apple, they stopped making keyboards and make iPhones. <laughs> so, this is the, the, the gestures you're using on an iPhone are the same that you used on these ones, which are very funny because that's it's those guys who made it. So that was like almost also but completely useless at the same time. Too bad. Um, so what keyboard should you use? Well, you have to read up yourself. You have to look. This wiki is good. It's called desk, deskfority.net. Uh, and it has a lot of information and has so much detailed information about switches and what switch to use and blah blah and everything. So I spent a lot of time before uh, buying my keyboard. You saw how it looked before, this 10 keyless black keyboard. I used Cherry MX Brown with dampener rings, which I mentioned before, and I have a Swedish ISO layout. That's what I use. That is the end of it, except that it's time for you to do exercise again, so you remember how to do it. Okay? Hands up, up, bend down, a stretch up, and assist. Stretch up, and the table, stretch up, thumbs up. You can bend the thumb back a bit if you want to, and then stretch the palm back a bit. And you're all ready to code. Here are the relevant links, uh, dextfority.net wiki, for this wiki with all the information. 
Kinesis is if you want to buy a Kinesis keyboard for $300 or up. So, uh, keyboard company is where I got my keyboard. I checked this morning, they don't seem to have Polish layouts. So you might have to go somewhere else. Uh, those keyboards uh, at least just only cost like, well, a hundred pounds. So they're still fairly expensive. Um, but that's what the best I found. There's other keyboards out there too, like keyboards where you actually have to be uh, LED screens on each screen so you can change the layout around. They probably cost a lot more than 300 dollars. Yeah, you can buy keyboards that have no keycap, no, no legends at all, they're completely black. It looks really cool. I could use one of those because I'm used to using Swedish layout on like French and Polish keyboards and stuff. But for most people that would be pretty horrible. But it's, it's fun. Uh, yeah, that's all. Alright, if you have questions, uh, raise your hand. I've already told you everything I know, but you can, you can just questions anyway. Yeah, so earlier this year Apple came out with a new MacBook. Are you aware of this revolutionary development? Uh, no, I saw something about that, but I forgot that they did that, so I didn't know. They that. actually had a Johnny Ive wire, like, locked in a white room explanation of the new butterfly mechanism. Which fits. Ah. Have you seen this? Because uh, no, I haven't seen that. But okay, so Apple uses a butterfly mechanism instead of a scissor keyboard. Yeah, yeah, because the scissor key like slightly bends in the one direction while the butterfly oh. goes straight out. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's probably, like probably good. I, mean, I, used, I used an Apple keyboard for years uh, before the old one uh, now. And it's, it's a good keyboard. It's absolutely not a problem with that, with that keyboard. It's nice and also does not have a. Uh, an uh, American keyboard, keypad. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have open end keys either, so you have to use alt and arrows for that. So that's one of the reasons that I switched. Okay, uh, about that Velotype keyboard that you showed, this uh, right. cloud keyboard, yeah. there is a very cool Python project called Plover. Uh -huh. Uh, and uh, they had talks on PyCon US, and uh, there are videos of people actually typing Python code on those keyboards. Oh, okay. And it's super fast. Wow, okay. And, that's that's cool. that's a, and you can use, if you have a good keyboard that has, uh, you can press a lot of keys at the same time, because yeah. that's another factor with crappy keyboards. Right. You have like multiple, multiplexed keys. Yeah. Uh, so if you have a good keyboard that you can press a lot of keys, uh, you can use that Python program for oh, for actually to learn stagonal typing. I think it's stagonal typing. Oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I have super fast. Well, that's that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, okay, as an addition for uh, uh, keyboard layouts you mentioned about, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of the fact that you can also uh, change it. I mean, uh, under Linux you, you, have, you, you can uh, freely uh, modify your keyboard layout with the Xbox Mac, for example, which actually I, I'm doing just to get rid of the useless catalog. Yeah, um, I've, I've, I haven't checked the last few years, but there are uh, tools to change your layout and make your own layout under Linux. La a couple of years ago, at least, they were still very hard to use, um, which is annoying. So I don't know if that has become uh, better, but they were they were very tricky to use, and uh, you would think you just had a nice GUI program to actually uh, change things around, but nobody had made that at least a couple of years ago. So, uh, But yeah, and also, uh, uh, at least under Ubuntu, I don't know how it is under the Red Hat uh, operating system, so I haven't checked, but under Ubuntu, you have a lot of options to move things around and switch switch the old keys with the meta keys and stuff like that and also 
uh, make cast off something else. So. Okay, uh, a question about some historical stuff. I don't know if you used uh, Solaris boxes or HPUX boxes, and there was a compose key. And yeah. what's your thought of the compose key? <laughs> well, I, yeah, the compose key is, is very funny, yes. They, so they have that on HP boxes, and as you say, Solaris boxes. I used Solaris extremely little, but I used HP quite a lot. So the compose key is pretty clever, um, and it's an explanation for other people. What you basically do is you press the compose key, and then you press an accent key, and then you press a letter, and then you get the accent of letter. So that's, that's pretty good, and I kind of missed that on, um, on the IBM keyboards, because that means that when you need this one tie, when I, because I use Swedish keyboards, right? But uh, I live at Konstka, which has a CD. That doesn't exist on Swedish keyboard. I have to actually switch to Polish layout just to type my address and then switch back. A compose key would have been very nice. You can actually map the compose key to menu. Uh, okay, I have checked. Okay. I, I, I used menu for other things, so I can do it. Yeah, so Maybe I could switch. I haven't thought about that. I could switch caps lock to be. Exactly. Compose. That's the best. And there is actually a ready option in Linux. <laughs> you just choose it. Use. Ah. Okay. That, that's that's in my opinion the oh, best use for. I have no idea. That 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 makes me so happy. <laughs> Have you used, uh, if, and if so, what do you think about Dust Keyboard by Meta.com company? Uh, I haven't used that. Uh, now I'm not, I'm, I'm now I'm worried that I, I mix the keyboards up. But Dust, Dust Keyboard is this, uh, I think, it, is this the backlit uh, keyboard that comes in different versions? Huh? The one with black keys. The one with black keys, right. Yeah, right. So I, I um, that's one of the keyboards I looked at when I, I uh, decided to buy keyboards. And uh, at that point, they didn't have ISO layouts; they only had ANSI. So that's the reason I didn't buy them then. They might have ISO layouts now. I also think to remember that they were kind of quite expensive. But I think they also had not only the black version, they also had backlit versions. So you actually have uh, where you can see the, uh, when it's completely dark, then you would actually have see through. I think they had that. If not, that was somebody else that also had, you know, backlit, which is nice, uh, but expensive. So, uh, yeah, I forgot to talk about backlit keyboards, but that's good if you work in dark groups. I wonder, did you saw the design of uh, King's Assembly keyboard from Kickstarter? Kickstarter, where they uh, took a ergonomic keyboard and split them into two separate halves, each for one hand. I haven't seen that one, but there, there, I have seen that there are keyboards that are that, that are actually separate, that you can... Uh, they usually have a little hinge, so you can put them together, but this one was completely separate, okay. So, so often they can put them together, but you can also then take them away, so you can sit like that. Uh, and and uh, that seems comfortable to me if you're attached to it, yeah. So why not? I think that's, that's a good idea. Okay, so I have a question. What do you think about this very useful key called Cat's Lock? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's in the wrong place. So I think it is. It's way too close to the tap key. So that's maybe the problem with uh, having uh, caps lock as compose. I think it's better than caps lock, um, but it might still be a problem. But I'm going to try that out. I tend to press caps lock when I'm supposed to press key, uh, press tab. That's that's what happens to me. Uh, how many keyboards do you have at home? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I get a shitload of keyboards at home, um, but I also have a lot of computers. So, so um, actually, I don't really have enough keyboards. <laughs> I could say. Uh, I, uh, so yeah, I mean, I, 
The main computers I use is, is the laptop, but I have that in a docking station, so I have this other keyboard and a, an external screen. But then I also have the lab computer, because when you work with OpenStack, you have to uh, scratch the machine and install stuff. It has to be very specific, um, and have specific versions of operating systems and stuff like that. So I have a separate machine for that, and that also has a keyboard, and that has a rubber dome, spongy keyboard, it's not nice. But I don't use it very much. And then I have lots of old, mostly broken keyboards, yes. What about a new MacBook uh, touch keyboard, uh, touchpad, um, with that tactile feedback uh, built in on vibrations? Did you use it? No, I haven't used that. Because it's pretty awesome, uh, I've used it uh, back in a while. Um, and I um, thought uh, maybe you had the, the, the same idea for that uh, touch keyboard right. I presented. Right. So the two ideas I had was this, that you would have a slightly different texture in the middle of each key, so you would know where your fingers pressed. You could feel if you pressed a, a key or not, and also then that it would slightly vibrate when you actually hit the key. Those were the, the, the two ideas. and. Uh, I, none of those are really my ideas. This vibration thing I've, I've read about way before. There's even ideas that you can vibrate in different ways to make your fingers feel weird in different ways and stuff like that. Very advanced stuff. Okay, uh, that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, so if you have any more, come to Lenard directly. And uh, thank you.